Hello everybody, welcome to Oscar Rusty Bucket. Subscribe to the channel if you have not already and drop a like on this video. It only takes one second and it makes a massive difference how this video performs in the YouTube algorithm. Also, real quick, go check out the newest episode of the shoot around. It should be either happening today or out already soon after this video goes up. So click that link, it'll be the top one in the description. We have our new host, Nick, who's the new editor of this channel. If you haven't seen it already, new chemistry to the pod. I think it's the best it's ever been since we've added our fourth titular member. Shengun probably involved in one of the funnier conspiracies of the last couple of years being that when he got drafted he refused to use the team's interpreter and he needed to use his own interpreter the conspiracy was that as a turkish citizen shengun was actually one of erdogan's cronies and he was sent here to like gather american intelligence and that's why he was with the interpreter another conspiracy i recently read about i think this was in like business insider you just scroll the most schizophrenic corners of the internet some people have compared this to when tnt got shack i think that says way too much about our talent or nick's but Regardless, it's a fun time, so I'd appreciate it if you checked it out. They're also calling us the white boy through the wire, so there you go. We're doing hot takes. If you want to see your hot take responded to, comment it down below. That is always going to be happening in the comments under these videos. But yeah, let's get into it. If Houston makes the playoffs, Ime Udoka should win coach of the year. The entire point of the award is to coach your team through adversity and surpass expectations. That is everything he's done for the Rockets this year. I don't disagree on Ime Udoka being a very strong candidate. However, I wouldn't go all, as, all the way to say that he would uh, should win coach of the year especially because it is a play-in spot specifically they're not going to make the playoffs legitimately you know they're not getting up to the sixth seed not that making the playoffs through the play-in is illegitimate but rather it's not the same as like solidly being locked in for sure also i don't know if this team really surpassed expectations that much there were a lot of people who thought houston could be really competitive and thought that houston could be a playoff team in the west now that was heavily contingent on the development of Jalen Green and to start the year Jalen did not look very good but he has looked great as of late and this team has started to look like the good solid playoff team in the Western Conference that it is very clearly capable of being. I don't think it's so much that they didn't live or that they surpassed expectations I think they originally underperformed to those expectations and they have now finally caught up to reaching about what the expectations were and just speaking of expectations my head coach my, my coach of the year is mark dagnalt of the okc thunder i think that if any team in the league has surpassed expectations it has been them while a lot of people had a lot of hype for okc going into the year not many people thought they were going to be a top three seed in the Western Conference, myself included, as someone who was very high on that team. He's my coach of the year, and even if Houston makes the playoffs, that's not going to change. Jamal Murray is the most underrated player in the NBA. This is a take you hear all the time, which is why I disagree with this notion. I would say this is akin to how Mike Conley was consistently called the most underrated player in the league back in the earlier days of my NBA YouTube career. I would call it even the Mike Conley effect, if you will, where if everybody thinks you're underrated, are you underrated anymore? Or are you just what Jamal Murray is, which is a player who doesn't really jump out in the regular season and then just goes bonkers in the postseason. I think I've said this about Jimmy Butler. I'd say the same thing about Jamal. If you're gonna play like that, you're probably perpetually going to be a little underrated and it's also your fucking fault so I don't have any sympathy for it. And in the case of Jamal Murray, if you wanna just average 20 points and six assists in the regular season, cool, go for it. Denver's still good, still have a high seed, and he can turn it on when the postseason comes around, but if you're gonna play like that in the regular season, you're not gonna make all-star teams, and you're going to not make all NBA teams. So yeah, Jamal Murray is talented enough to be an all-star and an all-NBA performer, but if he's not going to try in the regular season like that, then, you know, you reap what you sow. If Larry Bird played today, he would be significantly better and a GOAT candidate. Some of the biggest Bird career drawbacks were things like his longevity due to injury and his three-point shooting, which was still elite for his time, but not up to modern standards. In today's age, Bird would have been able to better take care of his body and have a much longer prime than what we got. 
he would also obviously be an even better three-point shooter because he would practice and shoot more and actually see it as acceptable to take them. Considering Bird in basically 12 semi-healthy years won three championships and three straight MVPs, who knows how much he could have accomplished had he had a career length more similar to other greats. Well, I agree with parts of this and disagree with other parts, which is kind of what you're going to get when you leave that many points in one comment. I disagree that the modern NBA is just inherently going to give Larry Bird more of a cushion to be the greatest because yes his era had the limitations of how they dealt with injuries how they manage their players something like I think literally what ended Larry Bird's career prematurely was that he hurt himself while shoveling gravel for a driveway for his mother. That's something that just isn't going to happen today. I, I understand there's people who like give him credit for just being that type of guy or whatever. Realistically, as much as you can idealize those things, it was fucking stupid. Just hire someone to do your fuck you. You are multimillionaire. You are preventing yourself from winning for making even more multi-millions of dollars. Also, if Larry Bird played in the modern NBA, he would have a comical amount of money instead of just being pretty rich. There's a significant difference between how players are paid today versus what they were then. So that's an element that would definitely be significant. I agree his three-point volume would be much higher. I also do not have any qualms with the idea that Larry Bird would play well in the modern NBA. I think people look at Larry Bird and they go, oh, this slow fucking white dude who can barely jump is gonna dominate the NBA. That's cute. Well, look at who is currently the top two MVP candidates right now two slow ass fucking white dudes who just have very good touch and very good passing ability. Same thing Larry Bird did. Uh, so I think he would be great. I think he'd shoot more threes. I think his percentages would be really good. I think he'd probably be a top at least 10 three point shooter in the entire NBA. One of the best playmakers, one of the best rebounders relative to his position and size. I think he'd be a top 10 player for sure. But the other element of this is that while the 80s had all those drawbacks, they did have the positive of the competition was not the strongest. The Celtics just had a fucking chokehold on the Eastern Conference for so long. Literally the year, the years when he won three straight MVPs, the Celtics had the three most win records in the entire league year after year after year and they did not find much comp uh, competition in the eastern conference other than the philadelphia 76ers when julius irving and uh moses malone teamed up i also think early in bird's career there was a year where they lost to julius irving when bird was still like a 20 point score instead of a 27 point score but other than that relatively easy competition relatively easy to make it to the nba finals and he had to play the showtime lakers a couple of times so he lost a couple of those series i think who if i'm remembering correctly there is going to be more difficulty to win being that he would be a top 10 player instead of a top two player or a top three player and the competition from the bottom of the league would be much higher the competition from every aspect is much higher so there are elements to this but i do agree that he'd be good in the modern nba i i think the notion that larry bird was just this guy who got lucky that he could dominate this weak era i think that's inaccurate i think his skill set applies very well to the modern nba and bird and magic johnson to some degree were well ahead of their time and shaped the future of basketball in that there were these six eight to six foot ten players who were dribbling and passing and shooting jump shots rather than the game being dominated by bigs in the big man way they were applying guard skill sets to being bigger players and that's why they dominated the 80s to the degree that they did because they'd never seen that shit before larry bird would work really well in the modern context as i do think a lot of strong offensive players would just because offense is easier now with more spacing modern basketball principles and so on. Devin Booker 96 decided to leave this one on two straight videos, so we're gonna go ahead and answer it this time. People underrate a team staff for winning. As a good head coach is important, however, a good assistant coach and staff could be just as or more important. Yeah, there are nuances to that that I think are just inherently hard for us to understand when you're not literally tangibly directly related to the product, you know? Like if you're in the locker room of these teams, you know these types of 
nuances. Whereas, you know, the fans were really only going to see the true forward faces. If I was to compare this to anything, I would say it's actually applicable to movies and TV and how like, for example, Vince Gilligan just gets all the credit for Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, even though there are so many different people who go into the process of something like that being made. You know, we always give the directors or the showrunners just all of the credit and glory, but the reality is uh, there are multiple different peoples peoples, different people below them that have significant levels of impact in the areas that they are working in. And all of that comes together to make a winning team or Breaking Bad. So yeah, I agree that the only problem is I think it's going to be inherently underrated because it's something that we just cannot know very well. You know, you might get clips here or there of people talking about these things it's not the same as intimately having that knowledge that stuff is very important but it will forever it's also just inaccessible to nba fans so it will forever be underrated charles barkley was actually right when he said an over-reliant jump shooting team is unfit to win championships warriors are used as the example but the warriors had two of the best three-point shooters in their prime along with the league's best defender and at the time the best bench and system to win. KD years were simply due to the Warriors having more talent, and the last championship was because Steph nearly perfected what it meant to be a three-level score. There has still yet been a team that won the championship, shooting and making more threes solely to beat their opponents. The 2018 Rockets had the best chance of proving Barkley wrong. I think there's a lot of nuances to this. I think over-reliant on anything is a bad thing. You know, the way that you're framing this, he said being over-reliant on jump shooting is unfit to win championships. I agree with that, but there's a balance to be struck with your shot diet. You know, over-relying on paint touches is not good. Over-relying on mid-range shot creation like the Phoenix Suns do is not good. You don't want to over-rely on any significant aspect. However, Charles Barkley was wrong in his assessment of those Warriors teams because he seemed to suggest that they just were three-point shooting teams. They just were a jump shooting team. And that was ignoring all these elements that you kindly laid out here that Clay and Steph are two of, if not the two best three-point shooters in NBA history, also had one of the best defenses in the entire league because of Draymond Green, which is why Draymond is underrated historically for what that's worth, because we just surmise the three-point, or the, the Warriors dynasty, I literally just did it, as the three-point dynasty, whereas the three-point shooting, as pivotal as that was in their success, was only a part of it, and we're also seeing in recent years where teams that are at the top of the league in three-point attempts are generally actually losing in the postseason. It's something that Alex Hoops has brought up on our podcast, The Shoot Around, like that the Boston Celtics this year are leading the league in three-point attempts, and that could actually spell danger for them in the postseason because of an over-reliance on threes. But teams have won, if not championships, at least playoff series just by making threes more. Like I, even last year, the Miami Heat just absolutely dicked down Milwaukee because they were shooting insane from outside. That's kind of an outlier example but yeah if you're just using three-point shooting as a crutch you're not going to win but if you're using anything as a crutch you're not going to win a championship there are multiple aspects that go into being a championship team and you can't just rely on one element or another to carry you that's not going to work but also just saying i don't know what do you define as a jump shooting team every team in the nba right now is a jump shooting team by contrast to charles barkley's time so at that point, he's definitely wrong about the notion that you can't be a jump shooting team and win a championship because if everyone's doing it, someone's going to win a fucking championship. And there's a reason everyone's doing it. It's because it's effective. So there are nuances to it. Yeah, you can take three-point shooting too far just like you can take anything too far. But I think three-point shooting is incorrectly assigned a bunch of blame for a lot of things in basketball when it's just one of the many elements that go together towards making a good and championship team. One note on why basketball is so goat focused also stems from the fact that it's the only sport where the simplest responsibilities of each player are the same 
makes it a lot easier to compare LeBron, Jordan, and Kareem, even with them playing different positions than Brady, Rice, and LT, for example. Yeah, that is an element of the game that I think makes GOAT talks a lot easier. You know, if you're talking about the NFL, a lot of people call Tom Brady the GOAT of football, but realistically, football is a lot more than just being a quarterback. So he's the GOAT quarterback, but is he the GOAT football player? That's a discussion that people have all the time. Whereas in the NBA, there can be more of a discussion about the GOAT basketball player because, as you say, while there are different positions, you know, every player is still expected to score, play make, rebound, defend every aspect of the game, the best players do that to some degree or another. Some exceed in other areas more because that's just the natural ebb and flow of the game. But regardless, you know, we can compare LeBron and Jordan's scoring ability where we can't compare Tom Brady's passing and Jerry Rice's catching. Those are two different skills within the sport where they are limited to those skills. So yeah, just basketball is, you have to do everything. Every aspect of the sport players are responsible for. And that's where scrutiny comes for guys who don't cover all their bases. And yeah, that's why the GOAT conversation happens because there is a greatest basketball player of all time. Whereas in other sports, it's like there is a best quarterback, there is a best running back, there is a best wide receiver. Is there a best, you know, just in quotes, football player? I don't think so. I don't, at least I don't know. Not a football guy as much. So I'm just using this as an example, but I think this is pretty much the case across all sports. Like there's strikers. Like how are you going to compare a striker and a goalie? How are you going to compare, what do you call the guy who hits it when the guy, the pitcher and the guy who hits it with the bat, a hitter, a striker, whatever. The guy who hits the fucking baseball and the guy who fucking throws it. It's two very different things. So yeah, that's just inherently a NBA thing, a basketball thing. Okay, apparently someone replied to this and we're also gonna respond to that. I feel like people compare basketball players more than other sports because basketball is the only sport where you can actually play one-on-one. -on -one. There is no one-on-one -on -one baseball, no one-on-one -on -one football, so basketball makes it easier to compare a player because we can imagine them playing each other. Yeah, that's another thing that I think happens is the across era comparison. That's also something that doesn't really happen in other sports where we're like, what if Mickey Mantle played with, uh, what's that What's that guy who just got in gambling? Shohei, Shohei Otani. Yeah, what if Otani and Babe Ruth played together? People aren't really saying shit like that. I'm sorry, Jacob. I'm not, I'm really not trying to invade the video. I just cannot sit idly by and hear you talking about it because Shohei Otani would take a guy like Babe Ruth to the fucking moon. He would bunt for 50. He would rake that shit over the fucking stadium, through the goddamn ceiling, which is something that he's already done. Let Shohei Otani get on the mound against a guy like Mickey Mantle. His head's gonna fucking explode. It would be like giving a pilgrim a Mountain Dew. Let Shohei Otani go up against a guy like Cy Young. I, please, please let it happen. Please let that guy go up against Nolan Ryan. I promise you, he's raking 600. This is why we don't talk about it. He's a physical fucking anomaly. He's a specimen. To the moon! But, you know, there's stuff that you can see and you're like, apply this skill set to this era, all that. It, it all makes sense why basketball is where we have these conversations. And that's personally what attracts me to basketball the most. You know, knocking down skill sets into this guy does this, this guy does that. It's more fun where everybody does a little bit of everything to some degree or another. Bring back the media take, pretty please. I mean, I need there to actually be takes to respond to. Sometimes there really isn't that much or not much that I can get a video out of. But when there's stuff that's just egregious, I'll be happy to do it. We could probably increase the volume of it a little bit though you're not wrong about that so i guess you know if that's something you guys want to see if you want to see me react to certain takes and stuff like that just let me know in the comments i guess tim duncan never winning a dpoy is so spiritually similar to spolstra never winning a coach of the year award i can understand voter fatigue in cases like Giannis and lebron never really being in mvp conversations after winning it a few times but when all-time guys don't even get one award in an area they are absolutely elite in it's so bizarre it's like having a preemptive voter fatigue. Oh yeah, we know that guy is great, but this is the story this year. I don't know if Spolstra not winning coach of the year or Duncan not winning DPOY is because people are like, yeah, those guys are great, let's move on. 
I think it's more that while Tim Duncan is one of the greatest defenders of all time, he didn't have a lot of years where he was like so clearly the best defender in basketball. Fucking Ben Wallace won multiple DPOYs that theoretically could have gone to Tim. And I really just think it's as simple as that, where, you know, you can be an MVP caliber player looking at your career at large, but when you're actually breaking it down year by year, how many times did you actually have the best case? I'm sure you can go find years in Tim Duncan's career where he truly was the best defender in the NBA and he should have won it, but I don't think it's as common as people think, and I don't think him not winning DPOY is as insane as people think it is, you know? I mean, the fucking Kevin Garnett won one of them. One of them. When he wasn't even playing the best defense of his career. The best defense of his career was in Minnesota, but he got to focus more of it on Boston, finally got more attention on him because of Boston media. It's just kind of the way these things go. Tim didn't win it. Spolster didn't win coach of the year because when he was winning crazy amounts of games, the Heat didn't were the big three, so he wasn't really getting credit for their success. Ironically, I even remember a lot of people suggesting that Eric Spolstra should be fired just because that's kind of what happens if you're a coach for LeBron. There's going to be discourse about how you should be fired. And then after that, you know, the Heat were mid for a little bit, and then even when they were succeeding in the postseason, you're not winning coach of the year for the postseason, you're winning coach of the year for the regular season. And if the Heat are not exceptional in the regular season, then that's just not going to happen. So it makes sense why these things happen. This is kind of similar to the Jamal Murray thing, where it's like you reap what you sow. The situation is just that you didn't try that hard to win this award, so you didn't fucking win it. That's just kind of the way that it goes. Tim Duncan, still one of the greatest defenders of all time, and not having a DPOY doesn't change that. Hot take, Rusty sucks for not finishing the Wemby Spurs 2K rebuild. You know, it's just, it is what it is. Sorry, the, the video, the videos didn't get enough support, and I didn't have any free time ever. I just, I've tried to make the 2K thing happen so many times, because I truly enjoy making those rebuild videos, but it's just, the algorithm doesn't like it, not enough, not enough of you guys like it, and it takes so much longer than work that makes me so much more money and takes so much less time. So I'm kind of an idiot to continue making those as much as I want to do it. And it's a, a way of expressing creativity, but also I have a lot of creativity in me and I'd rather put it in something that's not another fucking basketball thing. Rudy asked me if I'd be open to streaming some 2K rebuilds. Maybe when the new 2K comes out, I'll consider it. But yeah, I just don't know that there's enough of a market for it. 2K is kind of dead. Even though I think my format of video kind of, you don't even have to like 2K that much for you to still enjoy it because I try to be really analytical and break things down and have a real concrete plan and make it as realistic as possible but unfortunately uh doesn't really seem to click with people like I'd hoped it would Steve Nash is the most underrated point guard of all time I know he got two MVPs but most of the time people deem them as fraudulent I know if suck but I'd love to see him in the modern game dude could shoot I mean yeah I think the big issue with Steve Nash the reason why he is super underrated I agree is one those MVPs are seen as interruptive MVPs. This is something we talked about in my most recent main channel MVP video, the idea of an MVP being interruptive of what the story was supposed to be, you know? Steve Nash wasn't supposed to win that award. Kobe was, or Shaq was, or Dirk was, whoever it may be. So because of that, pretty much the only time you hear people talking about these MVP seasons is in a negative light. Which is not very fair. Even though I think Steve should not have won one of those two, I would have given him one of them, the first one, not the second one. Ultimately, yeah, the MVPs are put in such a negative light that no one actually appreciates Steve Nash for who Steve Nash was, which was one of the greatest offenses, offensive engines basketball has ever seen. And if he played in the modern NBA, he would shoot the ball a lot more. It's something he's expressed sentiment about, like, regretting not having shot the ball more, because he could shoot the lights out of the fucking ball, but he was only taking like 12 shots and that's just a damn shame with more consistency Lowry Markkinen can become the greatest shooting big man of all time well from the three-point shooting perspective Lowry Markkinen is already the best three-point shooting center or at least seven footer that has ever played the game there is no seven footer yes Dirk Nowitzki being one of them there is no seven footer who has shot threes on the volume and percentage that Lowry Markkinen has 
I think Dirk's peak three-point attempts per game was like five, and that was at an older stage of his career. Don't get me wrong, if Dirk played today, he could take more threes and just as much be in that conversation, but just like with the Larry Bird thing, he didn't, so he's not. As much as ifs are fun to discuss, he didn't, so he's not. Larry Markkinen taking eight threes a game on 40% as a big man, as a seven footer. There is no seven footer throughout history who has numbers that are comparable to that at all. And so long as he continues that streak throughout the rest of his career, yeah, he'll be the greatest three point shooting big man of all time. And then we can get in a discussion about greatest shooting period because Dirk is the best mid range shooting big man of all time and still a very strong three point shooter. So I would still label Dirk as the best shooting big ever, but three point shooting, Lowry Markkinen has that locked down and I don't think anyone's gonna compete with him for a while because even though we are getting more and more seven footers who can shoot the ball, none of them are quite doing it to that degree. Hot Takes is unlimited quality content for Rusty. Nothing beats that. Although I would say would love a Q&A series. Uh, so I keep addressing this in the video and I wanna keep pointing this out. We do Q and A's live on our podcast. So if you wanna ask me any questions, if you wanna ask Alex Hoops or Rudy or Nick, ask away, especially if you give us money for it with a super chat, we'll definitely react to it then. Come through for the pod. If this is the type of vibe you're looking for, if you just wanna chill and have a basketball discussion, that's exactly what we're doing. And we're not taking it too seriously, but we're taking it seriously enough that it's not just schlock. David Robinson is the most underrated player of all time. He should be in that 13 to 16 range with KD and KG. This is a difficult one because David has two championships, however, neither of which he was a finals MVP for and only one of them he was a star for. His last championship, I believe he averaged 10 points and six rebounds in that either finals or playoffs at large. He was just old as shit and just Tim Duncan's sidekick at that point, which is fine, but he didn't win a championship as the guy. Pretty much everybody, except for ironically KD and KG that you mentioned, were the guy on a championship team. In the case of KG and KD, they were more important to their championships than David Robinson was to either of them. They also, David did win an MVP, but I feel like KD and KG both had more prominent and well-known MVP seasons throughout history. I would say that KG has one of the five best MVP seasons ever, personally. And I just simply think they were better players than David Robinson was. David did not get good help throughout his career in San Antonio. I don't even know if he had an all-star teammate up until Tim Duncan was drafted. And if it was, it was definitely a fringe guy and nobody who was like a mega clear star. And he didn't have Greg Popovich up until the latter years of his career. So he didn't necessarily have the great Spurs organization. It was just him carrying the Spurs organization. I do think he's one of the more underrated players. I can agree to that. I wouldn't put him as high as 13 to 16. He might crack my top 20 though. Either MVP voting criteria needs to be reevaluated or a new award player of the year needs to be introduced. When someone like Luca is putting up the stats he is while his team is awful with him off of the floor, there's no way he isn't the most valuable player, but I wouldn't necessarily argue he's the best player. I mean, I don't really fucking think that the best player is ever has ever been what the MVP is. I don't know if, like I see people say that all the time and I'm kind of confused by that. Sure, there are plenty of years where the best player in the league is the MVP, but at least half of the time that's not the case. Even MVPs like Stephen Curry in 2016, Steph wasn't better than LeBron. He had a better season though. He played better than him throughout that year. So he won the MVP. It's more about who has the best year. So I guess player of the year, but the player of the year and best player is also something different. And I also think it's, there's something, I don't know if they do this in other sports. I think they do to some degree. But I don't know if you can just quintessentially crown a best player in the league. I think a best player in the league award is more controversial than an MVP award is. Like the MVP is ultimately exists in this gray area to a degree that we can shape it. Whereas the best player conversation, that's very black and white. And you're gonna piss off a lot of people if you're just like definitively this guy's the best player in the league. We're giving him this award. I just don't think that works. If you want to see some more discussion about the MVP in general, again, that is a main channel video, the most recent one on Rusty Buckets that will be linked in the description, probably the second link. That is it. Shout out to Nick for editing this video and goodbye.